promises it's nothing less than the promised land. Here, a little talent and a lot of attitude can pay off big, with contracts almost as large as the egos. And for those who haven't made it yet, success is just a let's do lunch away. Hollywood's heyday was in the early years, when it was the dream factory for the Saturday matinee. Back then, the stars carried their glamour straight from the screen to the streets, actually living the movie magic. On this episode of Mansions, Monuments, and Masterpieces, we'll go behind the scenes to three places where the stars shone the brightest. When it comes to old Hollywood romance, no place did it better than the Beverly Hills Hotel. The Pink Palace is the legendary site of movie deals, bungalow trysts, and a great deal of waiting to be seen. Old Hollywood power, on the other hand, ruled at San Simeon. Built by entertainment mogul William Randolph Hearst, the 165-room Spanish castle was Hearst's personal monument, as well as a pleasure palace for Hollywood stars. And in the town that movies built, one theater still remains an icon. Grauman's Chinese Theater is not only early Hollywood kitsch, it's the cement stomping ground of hundreds of stars. In a town that caters to the rich and famous, one place does it with legendary flair, the Beverly Hills Hotel. For almost a century, the Pink Palace has coddled actors and their whims, making the hotel the number one resort in a town that's all about resort living. Here, actors can make grand entrances, try to outglitter the chandeliers, cut deals in the polo lounge, or hide out for a bungalow tryst. It's everything an actor could want, and then some. It's an ironic legacy for a place built for anyone but movie stars. At the turn of the 20th century, Beverly Hills was just a scruffy little town called Morocco Junction, surrounded not by film studios and fancy restaurants, but by acres of lima beans. In 1900, um, California was just beyond the, the gold rush um, that had happened only 40 years before, and so it was still a pretty undeveloped, wild place and um, not a lot of anything other than agriculture for people who saw the future or gauged the future of California accurately, it held great potential. Burton Green was one of the first to see that potential when he showed up in 1905 looking for oil. It was a place where they could possibly drill for oil, and they came up with water instead of oil. So immediately, being smart businessmen, it's so simple. You think oil, you make money, but water, water means community. Water was something Green could understand. He had moved from lush Wisconsin to dusty California back in the 1880s. He knew that in these parts, water was as good as gold if you knew how to exploit it. So in 1906, he formed the Rodeo Land and Water Company and bought Morocco Junction. Green had big plans for the bean fields. In their place, he saw broad curving avenues, large residential lots, elegant mansions, and lots of green on the ground and in the bank. This new place would be called Beverly Hills. To sell his home sites, Green first had to entice people out to his development. He decided the best draw would be a resort hotel. He persuaded well-known hotelier Margaret J. Anderson of Hollywood Hotel fame to help him establish a grand hotel in the barren fields of Beverly Hills. People from across the country could come and stay here in comfort and look at homes for the potential of buying homes here. Green and Anderson agreed to hire architect Elmer Gray to create the perfect California design. The combination of styles which was prevalent in Los Angeles at the time was Mission Revival. Mission Revival was a style which was a replica style of the 
Spanish missions that were dotting all up and down the California coast. The missions had beautiful arches in a major long, kind of long uh, rectangular building. It was a very large scale uh, for that particular vernacular at the time, uh, but it certainly set the trend for residential development throughout Beverly Hills from then on. In 1911, first ground was broken in the dusty bean fields for this future trendsetter. The LA buzz was that the new hotel was going to cost a fortune. You can imagine it, uh, when they said half a million dollars that it would cost to build. In those days, half a million dollars is absolute phenomenon. And people would be coming out to see what was going on and how big this, this place would be. The Beverly Hills Hotel did not disappoint. The rambling structure was not only huge, but it was positioned to soak up Beverly Hills' biggest selling feature, the California sun. The hotel was situated as such so that every room in the hotel got sun at one point of the day or another. It had verandas so that people could sleep outside in the evening and the warmer nights. Um, it was constructed so that they had elbow room to feel comfortable in the lobby areas and about the hotel. Margaret Anderson built bungalows for guests who wanted even more elbow room and a home away from home. Little mansions hidden away in the Bougainvillea. It was the first hotel to be built with bungalows so that people could feel at home here and have separate rooms for the children and dining areas and living rooms so that they would totally feel comfortable and at home here while they were looking for potential home sites. On a balmy May evening in 1912, the hotel flung open its doors for the grand opening. Margaret Anderson and her son Stanley greeted the prominent guests. The opening night of May 12th, 13th, and 14th, because they couldn't handle it all on one night, were all the prominent members of the Los Angeles Society. The menu that was served, the music that was played, the entertainment that was uh, presented that evening. It was probably one of the most gala events that Los Angeles had seen. The gala drew just the crowd of potential property buyers Green wanted. Los Angeles society, real estate investors, and the well-to-do from back east. Guests like King Gillette of the Gillette Razor Fortune munched beef tenderloin and lamb and partied until dawn. Success was a given, or so it seemed. But as the seasons rolled by, it became obvious that Green had placed his Beverly Hills development too far off the beaten track. Because it was neither in the city or at the shore, even the swanky hotel was a tough sell to the high-class clients Green wanted. And a hotel that was this remote wasn't going anywhere. Finally, Anderson and Green decided to make the hotel appear prosperous. My grandfather, who was the manager of the hotel, was in, in partnership with Stanley Fox from Fox Studios. So he was able to work with the studios to hire extras to come to the hotel and to mill about and look comfortable and to play golf and hit golf balls and ride horses to make it appear as that they were guests because at the beginning there really were no guests here to stay to speak of. Using actors was a desperate move because they were the one group Green did not want moving into his posh new development. Actors were considered wild and loose, certainly no asset to the neighborhood. When people like actors would come to Los Angeles and want to rent an apartment or a house or something, sometimes there would be a sign that would say, no dogs or actors allowed. And many a time it would be said verbally to them. The dislike and the disrespect for actors and actresses was is universal and historic. It wasn't just L.A. Uh, L.A., when the Hollywood industry started, got a great number of these actors and actresses and made a big impact upon society here, and society really didn't like them. So there was an innate dislike of that class of people. But so far, that class of people was about all the hotel had, and they had to be paid to show up. Beverly Hills and its fancy hotel barely survived the first seven years. The hotel's fortunes would soon change, though, when it became a trysting spot for the rich and famous. 
In 1919, a full seven years after it opened, the Beverly Hills Hotel was still running half empty. In fact, the Pink Palace was bleeding red ink, as was the surrounding development. Then, Hollywood came to town. In 1919, America's favorite actors, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, were allowed to purchase a lot right next door to the hotel. Mary Pickford had a very wholesome kind of a look to her at the time in films. She was considered the America's sweetheart. She married uh, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., who was a wonderful swashbuckling actor who people just adored. So they weren't really worried that uh, there would be any kind of scandal in Beverly Hills when they decided to move into the city and build their wonderful palatial house called Pick Fair on the hills overlooking the hotel. Within months, Pick Fair was dubbed the White House of Beverly Hills and it drew the rest of the movie crowd like starlets to a casting call. Suddenly, Beverly Hills was the place to be. Actors, directors, and studio executives packed up and moved to the hills. Mansion after elaborate mansion sprang up overnight. Famous celebrities like Will Rogers, Gloria Swanson, and Charles Ray became instant neighbors. And the Beverly Hills Hotel became their hangout. It wasn't long before the stargazers came too, hoping to see someone famous at play. Well, uh, people have always been uh, celebrity happy. They always uh, want to come out for a, uh, a star. Everybody wants to see what the, uh, what the other end of the rainbow looks like. Better yet, they hope to see a scandal. Of course, trysts were held here by different actors with different uh, other actors. And we're talking about, you know, Clark Gable here with Carol Lombard. We're talking Clark Gable and others. We're talking about uh, Yves Montand and, and his people. I mean, there are many stories relating to middle of the night uh, kind of parties going on, people uh, sneaking into each other's bungalows. I mean, we can go on and on with these, these stories. Many are true, many, of course, were the folklore of the hotel. As the 1920s roared by, the days were bright and the nights even brighter at the Beverly Hills Hotel. But when the Great Depression hit, the flow of champagne slowed to a trickle. Between 1929 and 1933, the hotel really went to this, this slump, this bad slump, and people were scared it would close completely forever. The hotel was boarded up. It was just closed. Then, in 1934, the Bank of America foreclosed on the hotel. The bank's vice president, Hernando Courtright, was in charge of unloading the white elephant. When he saw the hotel could be had for a show tune, Courtright decided to buy the place himself. The Pink Palace had the kind of history he thought he could market, and he knew just how to do it. He knew that in order to get people to really come to the hotel, he needed to have glamour and people of glamour and notoriety and celebrity, and a lot of those people were his friends. So he asked the most glamorous people he knew to join him as investors. He uh, asked Irene Dunn and her husband, Dr. Griffin, he asked Loretta Young and her husband, Tom Lewis, and uh, a multitude of other celebrities to come in and uh, invest with him in this courageous uh, new venture of the Beverly Hills Hotel. He was a, a promoting genius and a marketing genius. And uh, I don't think uh, anyone ever looked back and felt they were sorry going in with him. Courtright began glamorizing the hotel by painting it a shade of pink more suited to satin ball gowns than to Mission Revival architecture. The idea was is to completely and totally change the image of the hotel for a younger, more romantic feel. Pink, it's not really pink pink, you know, it's, it's like a pastel kind of a pink idea which, which would brighten the hotel. It would feminize it a little bit too, not so rough like cattle and leather kind of a feel to it, but it would give it the sort of like an elegance that they were looking for. The elegance continued with a brand new porte cochere long enough to cover three Rolls Royces. The porte cochere is designed for arrivals with a capital A. Arrivals in the 30s and, of course, more recently, mean arrivals of people 
of some stature. So people that other people want to see arriving. So the entrance is very broad. It's intended for everyone to feel like a star. It was especially hard not to feel like a star in the lobby with its elegant chandelier and glamorous seating areas. The low ceilings and dim lighting created sets where actors could hang out waiting to be seen. But the best place to be seen was on the lobby staircase, making a grand entrance. It had to have that graceful quality that allows people in tuxedos and ball gowns to flow gracefully down. You, you, you need to walk down a stair as if a choreographer had designed your entry to the, to the ballroom. And so the stair is designed to lead you to the ballroom, not in shorts, but in, in, a, in a ball gown. The hotel's ballroom was the Crystal Room, one of the best places in Beverly Hills to throw a party. The Crystal Room was the room to go to for an event, for an affair. That was the place to have it. I've been to so many different kinds of events at the Crystal Room uh, where the stars were just uh, uh, glittering. The Society of Singers had events here at which uh, Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Dinah Shore would be there and would be singing and every table had another star at it. After a party, the stars headed off to their rooms through halls decorated with wild pink and green banana leaf wallpaper. It was designed for the hotel by Don Loper, better known for his loud tie designs. Courtright had given each bedroom a $3,000 shot of glamour, adding canopy beds, upholstered love seats, and marble fireplaces. But the most acclaimed renovation upgraded the children's dining room into Hollywood's legendary watering hole, the Polo Lounge. The Polo Lounge, of course, is famous for, uh, <laughs> for many things, a few fights, a lot of, uh, a lot of heavy drinking uh, going way back to the early days of uh, such famous uh, uh, drinkers as W.C. Fields and, and Humphrey Bogart and followed up uh, through the years with uh, visits by Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and so on and so forth. When the Academy Awards would be coming up, you'd find all the stars uh, registering here at the hotel. Uh, they'd come from all around the world and uh, they would uh, celebrate or uh, <laughs> bury their, <laughs> their losses here afterwards. By day, agents and producers huddled over the marble tables, negotiating contracts or sealing an actor's fate. At night, when the Sunset Strip closed down, die-hard drinkers moved on to the Polo Lounge. Under the pink lighting, famous couples like Charlie Chaplin and Paulette Goddard toasted their success. Clark Gable was convinced to uh, star in The Misfits by Arthur Miller uh, at the Polo Lounge, convinced him to star in it with Marilyn Monroe. Uh, in the Polo Lounge also was one of the most important deals ever, and that was the, the taking over of Paramount Pictures by Gulf and Western Company in the 60s. Uh, that was done in the Polo Lounge, apparently. Some people met in the Polo Lounge to break deals, like their marriage contracts. People who had husbands and wives um, didn't have husbands and wives in the polo lounge, and it was really dark, and, you know, they met up, and they could disappear into the hotel, into a room. Or a bungalow. Elizabeth Taylor honeymooned in them six out of eight marriages, choosing a different bungalow each time. Fortunately, since the hotel has 21 bungalows, there were enough to go around. When Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor stayed here, I took a telegram out to their bungalow, and it, this was at night. Uh, the door was open, just a screen, and I knocked, and she said, come in, and he was, he was laying on the couch, and th uh, this huge table completely filled with liquor bottles and Horlicks candy and vitamins and this great big huge diamond ring, um, a diamond necklace, it was just all dripping there. Dripping meant something else around the Olympic-sized pool. Catherine Hepburn uh, used to come in from the tennis courts after she was finished playing tennis. And she used to come in and uh, dive from the diving, did a uh, back somersault with her tennis clothes on. Of course, accommodating odd behavior was how the hotel built its reputation. The eccentric Howard Hughes lived there off and on for over 30 years, spending $350,000 a year on dozens of rooms. Well, Howard Hughes is someone that you never saw 
And then Hughes would not eat like everybody eats. He didn't want anybody to touch his food. So his food would have to be put out into the niche of a tree, and then he or someone would go and pick it up. Whole plates of fudge would be made for him. He would only take the center out of it, and then it would come back. The plates of fudge are gone now, but the Pink Palace is a tradition that the stars hang on to. It's wonderful that, uh, that we keep a little tradition. It's very often we, we discard some very wonderful things for new spectacular things that are not so good. This has a, a, a it's mature like a good wine. It's, it's, uh, it's part, of our, part of our lives here and I, it should never disappear. For the Beverly Hills Hotel, romping actors, and lots of them, have been the key to success. But at a fabulous castle just up the coast, the actors romped by invitation only. High in the Santa Lucia Mountains, a stone castle towers above the rocky Pacific coastline. The real-life model for Citizen Kane's Xanadu, it's San Simeon, the home of William Randolph Hearst. The fact that it could be built where it was at that time is pretty amazing because it was, still is fairly isolated, but then it was remote. It became not just a house or a castle as it's called, but really a Mediterranean hilltop town. The 100 room main house looms like a Spanish cathedral over a plaza and three exquisite guest houses. Each has an amazing view of the sun, the sea, or the mountains. The views are about the only thing that remain from Hearst's first trips to the mountaintop, where he camped as a child with his family and, of course, an entourage of servants. As the single, pampered child of miner and developer George Hearst, William Randolph grew up with all the advantages the Gilded Age had to offer, including European travel and early exposure to the finer things in life. He had the advantages of seeing the world, uh, which was a great education. I'm sure those travels is what made him want more and more and more. He collected things from all over the world, many of the things he never even saw. They were never unwrapped. He could have just meandered through life, silver spoon in hand. But at Harvard, Hearst discovered he had a new passion for the media. As business manager for the Harvard Lampoon, Hearst found there was power and money in the written word. William Randolph begged his father to give him the San Francisco Examiner, a faltering newspaper he'd picked up from a gambling debt. George Hearst finally agreed, and at age 23, William Randolph became a newspaper publisher. The brash young man printed a new kind of news that combined investigative reporting with lurid sensationalism. It made for a potent entertainment cocktail that kept the public thirsting for more. He was the consummate newsman um, that he would exploit and sensationalize any story uh, in such a successful way that he, he soon um, attracted millions of readers. And that's how he built his empire. He really was a very good businessman. By 1903, Hearst owned a fleet of newspapers and several magazines. At age 39, he married 23-year-old vaudeville dancer Millicent Wilson and launched into family life, eventually producing five sons. But family life lost its appeal 15 years later, when Hearst met young Marion Davies, a leggy Ziegfeld girl. Pretty, full of energy, and fun-loving, Davies was a natural comedian, and better still, 29 years younger than Hearst. Davies became the love of his life. She also prompted a midlife career expansion into the film business. Hearst got involved in the movie business because he basically had a love affair with Marion Davies. I think it's always been said that uh, among the rich, uh, they're not crazy, they're eccentric, and so probably anything goes. In 1918, Hearst launched Cosmopolitan Pictures, Marion Davies' first picture was Cecilia of Pink Roses, for which Hearst unleashed a newspaper campaign to guarantee the film's and Davies' success. The one-two punch of newspaper and film worked brilliantly. 
By 1919, Hearst was well on his way to becoming one of the richest men in the country. Now that Hearst was so monumentally successful, he wanted the monument to prove it, a home more immense than anything else in the country. He turned back to the mountaintop where he'd camped as a boy and began thinking big, really big. For his architect, Hearst chose Miss Julia Morgan, a tiny workaholic who was creating some of the best designs on the West Coast. One of the first women in architecture, she'd completed 200 commissions in a dozen years. Together, Hearst and Morgan began planning Hearst's grand monument. It would crown 250,000 acres of wilderness, a parcel of land larger than the entire state of Rhode Island. In 1919, entertainment mogul William Randolph Hearst launched the biggest private building project in the state of California. Working with architect Julia Morgan, he chose a Mediterranean revival style that smacked of Spanish cathedral. The construction was a logistical nightmare. Roads had to be carved to the site, and hundreds of craftsmen imported, housed, and fed. Hearst built a massive cement pier so supplies and building materials could be shipped in. When Hearst Castle was begun in 1919, it was a very isolated uh, place. It's still quite remote, but then there were no roads. There was no Highway 01 along the coast of California, and to get here was quite a, quite a trek. They brought, were able to bring in building materials because of the harbor at San I mean, it's one of the few safe harbors along the coast of California and Hearst was able to bring in the building materials and the antiques in those early years by coastal steamer. The massive main house, called, of course, Casa Grande, was made of poured concrete and steel. It soared 137 feet above the plaza and contained 100 ornate rooms. Hearst and Morgan consulted on every detail of the construction, including the intricately designed tiles, painted ceilings, marble fountains, and carved teakwood moldings. Five warehouses full of priceless antiques were emptied to furnish the home. The grounds were just as spectacular. Morgan brought in tons of topsoil, enough to cover 50 acres five feet deep, and created Italian gardens, terraces, pools, and walkways. The finished complex was about 90,000 square feet and was built at a cost of $9 million, which in, if you could build it in today's world, would be at least several hundred million dollars and perhaps more. Amazing feat that it was, it failed to impress Hearst's estranged wife. In 1925, he and his family spent their first and last Christmas together at Casa Grande. From then on, Marion Davies was the mistress of San Simeon. Under Davies' rule, San Simeon was more pleasure palace than cathedral knockoff. Celebrities like Charlie Chaplin, Carol Lombard, and Mary Pickford were regular house guests. Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart flew in, as did world leaders and politicians. A weekend at San Simeon meant riding horses, playing tennis, and swimming in the Neptune pool. On cloudy days, guests went underground to the Roman pool, lined with Venetian tiles of glass and hammered gold. They were free to do what they liked during the day, to enjoy the tennis courts or the swimming pools, maybe to go horseback riding, just to kind of relax in, in the beautiful surroundings. Evenings, though, the guests were expected to report for dinner with the hosts. The evening began with guests gathering in the assembly hall. The decorating style ranged across old Europe. Hearst and Davies would mysteriously appear from Hearst's secret elevator to his quarters. Then the party moved to the refectory, a 2,000 square foot dining hall under a hand-carved ceiling from a 16th century Italian monastery. When Hearst invited uh, a group of guests here, he generally invited uh, relatively small groups, a dozen or so people. And at about 9 o'clock, they would go into the refectory or the dining room for the estate. And there they would find uh, the, their seats by place card. And generally, the newest guests or the mo most recent arrivals were seated nearest 
their host. And then as their stay progressed or wore on, they might find their place card moving away from their host. It was a not too subtle hint that the guest was overstaying his welcome. One of those guests was British humorist P.G. Woodhouse, who finally found himself at the end of the table. He decided it must be time to go, because if he were moved again, he'd be, as he put it, feeding on the floor. After dinner, the group might head to W.C. Field's favorite, the billiard room, to shoot snooker beneath a 15th century French tapestry. Or they might wander over to the movie theater to see Davies on screen. Her movies were always squeaky clean. Hearst didn't allow her so much as an on-screen kiss. In fact, to the dismay of the acting crowd, Hearst was remarkably prudish. He was really strict. He was uh, a little crazy. He had a two-drink limit. I mean, at, the, at this point, why serve drinks? You're only going to have two. And he had a 7,000-bottled uh, wine cellar. I mean, he was probably just collecting it to look at it, I guess, to say he has a wine cellar. He had kegs of beer everywhere. And the guests kind of got around that rule. They brought their own booze in. Cary Grant did. Marion Davies, his mistress, hid her drinks in the, in the ladies' room. So they really had to go around like they were at a little Baptist, you know, uh, summer camp. At one party, several B-movie actresses managed to sneak an extra cocktail or two and eventually decided to go out and donate their underwear to the nude statues on the grounds. When they returned to the dinner table, they found their place cards moved to the very end of the table and their plates heaped with whiskey and gin bottles. But Hearst didn't let his delicate sensibilities keep him from throwing some extravaganzas. For costume parties, he brought in Hollywood seamstresses and makeup artists to outfit the guests. He tended to like costume parties. In fact, we know of a couple of parties staged here in the 1930s. One was a, a pioneer theme, the other was a Civil War theme, when there probably were around 100 guests here. For the overnight guests, there truly wasn't a bad room in the house. But some of the rooms were spectacular, even by San Simeon standards. The Doge's Suite, for instance. There are things that make it unique, that make it different. There's a beautiful balcony with carved marble archways with cloverleaf-like design that you can see that's reminiscent of the balcony on the Doge's Palace in San Marcos Square in Venice, Italy, and thus the name for this guest suite. Within the sitting room of the Doge's suite, you can see that Mr. Hearst collected not only fine arts and decorative arts, but also architectural elements, ceilings, fireplaces, doorways, and the like. In the center of the room on the Spanish table lies a carved basalt figure from Egypt dating back to the third century BC. And here we see a, a ceiling uh, with two components to it. Uh, the center oval-shaped painting is a Dutch painting from the 16th century that depicts the Annunciation of the birth of Christ to the shepherds. And the balance of the ceiling is carved and painted wood from Italy from the 18th century. But most visitors angled to stay in the octagonal celestial suite. Although guests had to clamber through an unfinished stairwell to reach it, their reward was a suite spanning two towers. The views were magic. Hearst's Gothic bedroom suite was hidden away from the prying eyes of guests. Here, under his inlaid ceiling, he could rule his empire. It made him feel like an earl or a king or a prince. He was a manufactured one, but many people, even today, live in those kinds of rooms that makes them feel more important, and he had to be the king of the hill. Since Hearst never divorced his wife, he maintained propriety by setting up Davies in her own bedroom but it was only a sitting room away from his. He wanted to maintain propriety with Marion Davies, so he has a separate room for her, you know, um, and he has these, you know, this, this very discreet drinking code. Uh, those are just two examples, but I think he still was very much, in some ways, a uh, Victorian gentleman, if you will. As large as the main house was, it still wasn't enough. Hearst wanted more buildings to surround his Spanish plaza. He and Morgan built three guest houses, each more elegant and ostentatious than the last. In the Casa del Mar, guests like Errol Flynn slept on a 17th century canopy bed overlooking an ocean view. 
the Casa del Sol's rooms looked out to a view of the setting sun. The Casa del Monte was the smallest of the three, a mere 10 rooms. The building frenzy at San Simeon continued for 28 years. Eventually, the buildings enclosed over 90,000 square feet, almost enough space for Hearst's enormous art collection. It's difficult to know whether Hearst was buying to furnish his various building projects or building to display his various art collections that he was acquiring, but he was a voracious collector. He collected in, in a lot of different areas. We have here at San Simeon his Spanish and Italian collection from the 16th and 17th century primarily, but he collected for a long period of time and was well known to, to the dealers in New York especially. Hearst continued to collect and entertain until 1947, when poor health finally forced him to abandon San Simeon, along with an unfinished wing and more warehouses of antiques. He died in 1951. And six years later, the Hearst Corporation donated the most elaborate product of Hollywood's golden age to the state of California. Now, movie stars and costume balls have given way to tennis shoes and tour buses as San Simeon entertains an entirely different crowd. While the glory days are now just a memory at San Simeon, they're very much alive and well at another Hollywood landmark. This old theater has seen it all, from Academy Awards to only in Hollywood cement ceremonies. The great thing about Grauman's Chinese Theater isn't the pagoda look, or the 30-foot stone dragon, or even the fact that more movies have premiered here than any other place on Earth. No, the great thing about Grauman's is the cement. Since 1927, Hollywood's biggest stars have been planting their hands, feet, and other famous features in the cement forecourt of the theater. It's the ultimate Hollywood salute, one that draws two million tourists a year. The cement forecourt and the theater behind it were the brainchild of master showman Sid Grauman. His love of movies went back to the earliest flickering days of film, when he and his father had gone into the theater business. He and his father had emigrated to San Francisco in the early 1900s, and the, the story goes that he had, um, they had a couple of small theaters in San Francisco before the earthquake and that Grauman's claim to fame was that he put up a tent theater after the earthquake and was able to distract people from their troubles by showing very crude movies in terms of the situation. They rebuilt their theaters, movies became very popular, they became very strong exhibitors in the Bay Area and then they decided to expand. Sid Grauman followed his love of movies right to the heart of the industry in downtown Los Angeles. First, he built the enormous Million Dollar Theater on Broadway. Then, in 1922, inspired by the discovery of King Tut's tomb, he built the Egyptian. For a showman like Grauman, the sky was the limit, literally. He was the first to place sweeping searchlights in front of a theater. Still, Grauman wanted more. He wanted to build a theater to end all theaters, the most elaborate, the most exotic, and above all, the most theatrical. As Mark Slow, who was one of the great movie moguls and also owned a lot of theaters, said, we sell tickets to the theater, not to movies. And it was really the totality of the experience, of the arrival, the procession, through the sequence of spaces, into the auditorium itself, that was as memorable as anything that was going to be shown on the screen. There was one problem, though. Grauman needed money, and lots of it. Fortunately, the same little lady who had jump-started Beverly Hills was willing to give Grauman a boost. Mary Pickford, along with Douglas Fairbanks and Joseph Schenk, came up with the $2 million Grauman needed to realize his dream. The groundbreaking ceremony for the Grauman Chinese Theater was held on January 5, 1926. Miss Norma Talmadge, the star of stars, turned the first shovel full of dirt. Then, the real spending began. 
Grauman spared no expense or effort to make his new theater an authentic Chinese experience, showman style. He got permission from the U.S. government to import rare Chinese foo dogs, believed to ward off evil. He hired Chinese poet and film director Moon Kwang to oversee creating 46 statues to decorate the interior. And in the 2,000-seat auditorium, he built opera boxes instead of a balcony, so America's new royalty, Hollywood celebrities, could enjoy their privacy. After 18 months of construction, Grauman's Chinese Theater held its opening night on May 18, 1927. The feature was Cecil B. DeMille's King of Kings. The theater itself was the main show, though, beginning with a 30-foot-high stone dragon flanked by two wrought iron ceremonial masks. Inside, the lobby was a fantasy of exotic gardens, mythical cities, and wax figures. Red silk and velvet draped every available surface, and a giant Chinese lantern stood in for a chandelier. Even the ushers and usherettes fit the theme, dressed in elaborate silk costumes embroidered with gold thread. The new movie palace was considered impressive by most, but impressively awful by a few. Perhaps one of the most famous criticisms involves Harry K. Thaw, who shot Stanford White, the famous New York architect who created some of the great mansions of Newport. Thaw, upon being released from jail in the 1920s, visited Los Angeles, and upon seeing Grauman's Chinese, he exclaimed, my gosh, I shot the wrong architect. Whether the architect was right or wrong, the theater was an instant success. But Grauman, ever the showman, still thought he needed a gimmick to really set the theater apart. Once again, Mary Pickford gave him the answer, and quite by accident. Mary came home one day from shopping. She had her little dog, Zorro, with her, and they were putting in a cement driveway at Pickfair. And the dog got nervous and jumped out of the car and ran in the wet cement. The cement people were chasing the dog, yelling, kill him, kill him. And Mary's saying, oh, no, no, now we'll have little Zorro with us forever, his hand and footprints. She went in the house, and there was a phone call from Sid Grumman, and she repeated what had happened. Several days later, he got the idea from that phone conversation to do the hand and footprints. Mary Pickford was one of the first to leave her footprints in cement at Grauman's. And at Grauman's, even the cement is special. One of the builders stirred up a secret recipe for the slabs that 70 years later still haven't cracked. The cement stays as smooth as the celebrity faces, no matter how many decades roll by. After 70 years, the concrete forecourt now contains close to 200 prints from everyone who's been anyone in Hollywood. Some of the prints are unusual, like George Burns' cigar, or Roger's gun, Trigger's hoof prints, and Betty Grable's leg. Marilyn Monroe suggested imprinting something else. Marilyn Monroe and Jane Russell uh, put their uh, prints there when they were in Gentlemen of Her Blondes. Uh, Monroe suggested that she leave a print of her derriere and uh, that Jane Russell leave a print of her famous bosom, but the theater absolutely said, no way. Grauman died just a few years before, so he missed this opportunity to really bring in the crowds. But even with a G-rated forecourt, the theater has remained Hollywood's biggest tourist attraction. Grauman's Chinese Theater, San Simeon, and the Beverly Hills Hotel, there are no better links to the golden age of Hollywood. <laughs>